Um, I, at this time, I think uh, it might be a good time for me to just talk yeah. about the program. And I just want to say good morning. And thank you for attending our third weekend speaker highlight series in commemorating Black history in the month of February in homage to Carter G. Woodson, the father of Black History Week. I'm Marilyn Campbell, grant program manager with the Louisa County Historical Society's African-American History Program. And it is just one of several community-oriented programs the society provides. The program was created because as stewards of Louisa County's history, the Historical Society realized they needed to better reflect the African-American community in its archival collections. So in November of 2020, a Community Advisory Council was formed in partnership with the Society to guide a pilot program with three main projects to commence in 2021. The first project was the Freedom of Choice Remembrance Project, reflecting the oral histories of the 13 students to first integrate Louisa County High School in 1965. A historical marker dedication was held last weekend, February 12th, to commemorate those students and their names are listed on the marker. The project coordinator is Vernon Fleming. He's also a student of that era. The second project is a community-wide oral history campaign to capture the voices in community, especially those of the elderly. And um, we invite you to participate. We invite you to participate because we're collecting those oral histories. The oral history coordinator is Latika Lee, and we've declared April as oral history month. So I would like for you to look forward to our programs that we will be announcing. And the third project, a research of best practices for developing a curriculum of local African-American history for the local schools. And we are happy to have on board uh, an intern, a Louisa High School student, Gabriella Whitfield. So we celebrate today by our commitment to listening to communities and bringing voices to the community to share valuable resources. Our guest speaker today is to do just that. And at the end of the presentation, we will have a question and answer period and leave our contact information, as well as tell you ways that you can help us build this program up, whether by contribution of funds or by artifacts or by interviews. So we have our executive director, Caitlin Coglin. She can take it from here because we have our guest speaker, Lissada Cawthon White. And Caitlin, can you go forward? Yep, absolutely. Well, welcome again. And technical difficulties have now been resolved. It's always a new adventure every time we do one of these things. And you'd think two years into a pandemic, we all have figured it out by now, but <laughs> we're still all learning. So um, I just wanted to thank everyone for coming. Um, and give a little introduction. So Basida Cawthorn White is our guest speaker today. Um, she will be uh, talking about recognizing and sharing family treasures. Um, these are uh, really important, as I'm sure all of you know, that family treasures are a highly valued possession and have been passed down from generation to generation. They might be things that have just been acquired or hold special meaning um, about family stories and experiences. I know I have plenty of my own, um, and I'm sure you all do too, but they can be anything. And for me as an archaeologist, this is something that is really interesting because, you know, I look at these from the discard 
place, but this is talking about how we can incorporate them into our stories now and our stories moving forward through the future. So um, Besida Cawthorn White holds a BS and her Juris Doctorate, um, and she's been a ge genealogist for nearly 40 years. She is the family historian for nine families and manages DNA results for more than 40 people. Um, an independent community historian, she's the co-founder and president of the Middle Peninsula African American Genealogical and Historical Society and a founder of the Greater Richmond AAHGS. Um, Ms. White is the editor and co-editor of um, A Reunion of Recipes, The White Family Cookbook. Help Yourself, There's a God's Mighty Plenty, A Treasury of Recipes from the Cawthorn and Brooks Families and gather uh, at the welcome table, the angel visit Baptist Sesquicentennial, there we go, <laughs> cookbook. Um, so she's been doing this for a very long time and is an expert in how to kind of weave all of these different aspects of our family histories together from DNA, from um, archival research, from the oral history component, um, so we're extremely thankful to have her today. And um, we also have some handouts for you. We'll talk about this later. But um, in the um, handout tab above your chat, um, we have some handouts that will be shared throughout the course of the program, um, including resources from um, Besida herself. So thank you very much and please take it away. <laughs> Good morning. I hope you can hear me. Can you? Yes. Yeah, this has been a technical <laughs> challenge this morning. Wow. We started out at 930 to try to work out all the kinks and the kinks just kept getting kinkier and kinkier. So we have not even tried because we couldn't, I couldn't get on. So we've not even tried the screen share. So that's what I need to do with my screen share. And I just sent my PowerPoint to uh, you, Caitlin and Marilyn, in the event that somehow my screen share doesn't work. So let's see. I've not used this platform. So where will I see? Next to the camera icon on the bottom of your controls, it's a little computer with an X through it. Yeah, OK. All righty, let's try that. Let's see, wow. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. <laughs> oh, wow. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Given our morning, that's truly amazing. Now you can still see my screen and you can see my full screen. Yep. Yes. Okay, cool. Well, we're, we're cooking with gas. So thank you, Louisa County Historical Society for inviting me to join you today. And um, we're going to hope that the technology holds out so we can proceed. Um, I'll tell you, I am um, have always uh, kind of collected things and been a pack rat. Um, and you know, with no particular um, thought in mind about what I was doing, and I was in a session um, fairly recently, and the speaker started to talk about family treasures. And then I was in another session when the person was talking about material culture, those things that we keep around us. And I thought, hmm, I have a lot of stuff around here, a lot of stuff, and um, that has been collected during all the years that I've been doing family history. So um, family treasures, that's my kind of topic of the last year or so. And so what are family treasures? Things we really value. You know, that was grandma's uh, dish that she used. That was her, um, her, her rolling pin. So things that have been passed down from generation to generation or family treasures may be newly acquired. It may be something you've just got, but that you really, really um, think a lot of. They hold special meaning, tell stories about family experiences, and they just enrich that sense of family and community. 
um, they are highly valued um, based on the memories and connections to people, places, and things, although that value may not necessarily be monetary. So what are family treasures? It can be almost anything. Jewelry, furniture, and housewares, clothing and textiles, books and documents, photographs, tools, musical instruments, artwork and craft work, medals and awards, anything at all that you think is valuable to you. Those are your family treasures. Um, what, what, why do we keep those? What do they do? They provide comfort. They make you feel good. They are warm and fuzzy. They tell family and community stories. They bring those stories alive and shed life, light on the lives of our ancestors. I like to say that the treasures help us to put flesh on the bones of family history. They illustrate the narratives of our family and community, and they may pique the curiosity of family members who were previously not interested in family history. And um, that's one thing that I always like to, that how can we get people interested in family history who are not necessarily interested and who have not been? For those of you who are family historians, you know that sometimes when you're talking uh, people's eyes start to glaze over because, you know, you're rattling off um, dates and birth dates and death dates and all that kind of thing. And not everybody is as interested as some of us. And so that's um, sharing these items, sharing that those treasures can help. Um, so what I want to do is just talk about some of the treasures as I looked around and said, well, what do I have? What are some of those things? And some of them are old. And I, I'm not going to talk a lot about photographs because that's kind of another, uh, another talk, another discussion. But I do want to talk about how we use photographs to uh, make the items or make the treasures come alive. So what you see on the screen is... Um, a postal commission. My great grandfather was um, commissioned as the postmaster at Dunsville, Virginia in 1897. And so this is one of my most valued position, his, uh, possessions. It's obviously old, and that's my great grandfather's picture. And so um, I was actually watching something on. Um, a documentary made by Hannah Ayers and Lance Warren on lynching. And there was a postmaster in South Carolina who was a black postmaster who was lynched, who actually was made the postmaster, was commissioned at the same time my great grandfather was, and he was lynched because of that. And so when I heard that, I just um, had all kinds of thoughts about the time and place and people. Um, this is, and Beside one of the reasons I'm looking at some of these uh, items is we did for my family uh, Christmas dinner. We've had a family Christmas dinner every year since at least 1955, and we come together. This is uh, my, it used to be my aunts and uncles. Now there's only, in their families, there's only one uncle left. And so it's largely my first cousins and their children and grandchildren. And of course, we've met in person, but the past two years, we um, met virtually. And so one of the things we did um, at this last virtual Christmas, white family Christmas dinner, was to share treasures. And this is one something that my first cousin shared that and I don't know much about it, but it belonged to my step grandmother, and so it is a is a something that she treasures that now belongs to her, and she's going to have it sized that she so she can wear it because it's so small, she can't even hardly fit it on her pinky finger. Besides so this is um, something what? that um, <laughs> another something very old I treasure. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is, you can barely read it, but this is the graduation invitation from Wayland Seminary in Washington, D.C. in 1897. And Wayland Seminary is one of those institutions that um, made up, eventually made up Virginia Union University. Um, but this is the original um, that you see pictured here and was actually given to me by um, 
one of my genealogy society members who knew that my uh, great uncle was in that class. And so, I, yes. Um, we're not seeing your um, heirlooms. We're seeing your PowerPoint still. You're seeing what now? Your PowerPoint, but not, it's your like heirlooms. just your, um, yeah, your heirlooms aren't showing. So are they on a different screen? Um, <laughs> no, so you, so you saw my first PowerPoint screen, but are not seeing. Yeah, any of the screens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You haven't advanced. Okay. okay, so we're going to stop sharing. <laughs> and I can. And let's see if we can share. And go to sharing again. Just advance to the next slide once you start. Well, see, I was on my screen. I was advancing. I was way down in the slide. Yeah, <laughs> I was like something. Okay, is wrong. so let's. Um, and I'm gonna see. Let's start sharing again. And see. Let me cancel that. All right, so I'm uploading the PowerPoint directly to it so we can, we don't have to worry about screen share. Um, so okay, so why don't, yeah, why don't yep. you um, do that, Caitlin, yep. and then. You just share with us. Yep. All right, it'll be ready in a few moments. Yeah, it was just showing the main screen. It wasn't like it wasn't advancing. Yeah, I uh, could go figure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was seeing slides of plenty. All right. It's uploading. Still uploading. <laughs> Well, you definitely had my imagination staring and I was trying to see all that you had on that first screen. I'm <laughs> trying to visualize. Well, <laughs> well, if it's yeah. any consolation, the first two or three screens were text and just what I was. So it, it was a while before I got to. I think the Postal Commission was probably the first right. item that you could see. So. Sorry, it's PowerPoint it takes <laughs> a while. <laughs> it's probably a fairly large, yeah. Probably a fairly large file. Yeah. It says it's processing, so hopefully a couple seconds here. Yeah, well, everyone, um, as we go forward and wait just a few more moments, we want you to just know that um, you have these items in your household. And recently I gave a presentation with, uh, with a group of people of my Aunt Esther's hats. She bequeathed those to me. And um, before her passing, we talked about so many of those things. And I have those as my special collection. She had about 50 hats. So now we do have our slide presentation yeah. and we can talk some yeah. more about uh items people have in their homes as well so Rosada, take it from here okay. thank you marilyn and thank you for what you just said you know when we first started to talk about this at the genealogy society level and also my family level folks said well i don't have anything um you know you have all those things but i don't really have anything and then as my cousins saw some of the things that some people shared, they said, well, well, I do have uh, thus and so. And so thank you for reminding us to just think about the things we do have. So we talked about this is the Postal Commission. You heard about it. And that's a picture of my great grandfather. So we'll have to do the ask Caitlin to move on to the next slide bit <laughs> since uh, She's controlling the slides, and this is my grand, my step grandmother's ring um, that's going to be resized. You heard about that, so my cousin can wear it. 
Um, and then we started to talk about the Wayland Seminary graduation invitation, actually the original. Um, and um, so what I've done is transcribe it, which that's the next slide, so that um, one can read it. Uh, so that can you next slide, Caitlin? Okay, so that's what it actually says. And my um, great uncle was the president of the class. And so this is one thing about family treasures is you, some of them are in your house, but then there are family treasures that you can find elsewhere and that are nonetheless family treasures. So as I said, this was given to me, but then I wanted to uh, kind of develop this item. So if you go to the next slide, um, Caitlin, this is actually a picture of the class that was graduating, that that was the graduation um, invitation. And this picture came from the Virginia Union University Special Collection. So I was able to, and it's very precious to me, so I was able to um, actually visualize the class. And that is my great uncle sitting right in the center. You see him turn to the side there. Um, he's the president of the class sitting in the center of that photograph. Um, and then on the next slide, um, a fellow researcher found a picture of the same uncle in the um, special collection at Temple University. It's a part of the William Still family papers. And uh, so you never know where you will find these treasures. And she, the person who found this was actually her, William Still was the noted abolitionist in the Philadelphia area. And she was looking at the William Still papers because her family married into the Still family. Her relative married Still's granddaughter. And lo and behold, she finds my great uncle's picture as she's looking for what she's looking for. And so we know that this research and work that we do is very much a shared kind of thing. And so with my great uncle, whose name was William Andrew White, and that's two items related to him that have been shared with me by other researchers. And I thoroughly appreciate that. Okay, the next slide. Um, and this is a brother to the person you just saw. Uh, this is my great grandfather. And he was, we have so much oral history about him and this helps it to come alive. He was a cobbler and a shoemaker and a casket maker. And uh, I would say a jack of all trades, but this chair that you see there in the center of the slide he actually made. And it's caused me to look up well, how you, uh, what you do to treat wood, to wet it, to make it bend. And you see how the sides of the chair are, are curved. And so he had that skill and that um, chair is now actually owned by my first cousin once removed, one of them. And then this is a bed owned by the same gentleman and it's massive. It, hard to see it there, but you can see it's almost up to the headboard is almost up to the ceiling and it's way above my head and I'm almost six feet tall. So this is a very massive bed that he owned. And you see he uh, was born in 1857, born enslaved in King and Queen County and died in 1937. Um, so that's how we tell a part of how we tell his story. Unfortunately, we don't have any of the boots and shoes he made. Of course, we don't have any of the caskets he made but uh, we are thankful to have this chair and his bed. Next slide. So this is my grandmother, uh, Ida Smith Cawthon, born in 1884, died in 1965. And I was looking through um, some of my mother's things and I found this gold, I'll call it medallion. And um, on the front side, it says Ida S. Cawthon. On the back, it says WBDMC, 1916 to 1942. Now, fortunately, I did know what that was. It's the Women's Baptist District Missionary Convention. And I happened to know that, so I didn't have to research that piece of it. And I knew that she had held office. And so this set me on the path, and this is gold, uh, set me on the path of seeing if I could find the minutes of the um, gathering where she received this, and it says 1942. So I started looking in at the minutes of this organization in 1942, 
and didn't find anything. Fortunately, didn't have to look too long because she got that award in 1943, which makes sense that it was celebrating through 1942. But uh, that is one of my totally prized possessions. Next. Okay, and this is from the same uh, great grandmother. My family is really, we really pack rats. And so this is actually her contract um, to teach in King William County uh, in school year 1937-38. And I have it in the very envelope in which it was mailed to her. And I just thought it was interesting as we look to tell those stories, 4750 per month for a term of eight months. But teachers shall be held responsible for the sanitary condition of all school buildings and grounds at all time during the school term. So basically, she was hired as the teacher and the janitor and the building manager and the custodian and all of those terms that you might use. But um, and I have a number of her things, but I just wanted to throw it. So when I tell her story, I use all of these um, items that I have, lots of writings of hers and so on. Um, and then I have her featured in school yearbooks um, as a teacher. And she retired in 1948. I've got the class that she was the class sponsor of that information. Lots of lots of newspaper uh, coverage on her. Next. Okay, and this is her husband, my grandfather. Um, and the story on this, it's, it's really a fascinating story. So he grew up in and lived his life in rural Essex County, Virginia. And uh, when people went to the city, um, they went to Baltimore. They went on the steamship to Baltimore and off the Chesapeake Bay. And so the family story is that he, when he was 19 years old, he went to Baltimore on the steamship and he had his photograph taken, this photograph. And um, for some reason, the family history says that the photographer gave him this cut glass punch bowl. Now, why it is that a photographer gives you a lovely cut glass punch bowl, I'm not quite sure, but that's the family, um, that's the family history. So this is this two-part punch bowl. Again, something that we value, but it's so nice to have the two that at least within the family, history or within the oral history, the two go together. And he was 19 years old um, at the time, is, uh, is what the history says. So that places it just very early in the 20th century. Okay, yeah, we can go to the next um, photograph. And this is one of those family mysteries now. This is, and that's why I said this is a Yale University Debate Club medallion. And um, this is my great uncle. He did not go to Yale. He went to Harvard. Um, he went undergraduate to Lincoln. He went to Harvard Law School. He was on the debate team in both places. And by the way, um, his is a history that's very vivid right now because he died in the influenza epidemic of 1918, and as well as his sister died. And we always have you know, we heard that, we know it, and of course it has taken on new meaning in the present pandemic as we think about that, you know, my great grandparents lost two of their children to the, uh, pan to the uh, epidemic. But at any rate, this uh, debate key, we can't figure it out. Um, it's not, you can't see it, but that's not his name on there and he didn't go to Yale. But he is the only person in our family of that era who was anywhere near an Ivy League debate club. So um, why he would have had somebody else's key, but that's, um, or somebody else's, that's a myth, that's one of the family mysteries, but we hold on to that medallion and maybe someday we'll um, do the research to see if we can find the families of the several people whose names are on the back of the key. Right, and these are, um, I picked up this picture actually from the um, Black History and Culture Center in uh, Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. This was a part of their Black History Month display on one of my cousins, um, William Andrew White. Um, and this is his sister, Portia White. So I like to tell their stories together. Portia was a contralto who had a um, 
a status uh, in a profile in Canada, cons really very similar to Mar Mar um, Marian Anderson's statue in this country. And so she was a famous contralto. She sang for the Queen of England and so on. And her brother, she had many, they were two of 13 siblings, but her brother was a composer and social justice activist who was the first black person to run for national office in Canada. So go to the next slide. And this, these items that I own tie Bill and Portia together. So he um, liked to dabble in needlework. And so Portia died young, 1968 of cancer. She was quite young. And she had marvelous gowns, the beautiful gowns of which she sang on the concert stage. And so Bill decided to memorialize his sister by making pillows from her gowns. And so these pillows are just so wonderful because the needlepoint on one side is done by Bill. He did needlepoint. And then the other side, like the first one is uh, the one you see at the top that was a blue, beautiful blue ball gown and velvet. And so that's from Portia's dress. And then the one at the bottom, of course, is a gold satin ball gown. And again, Bill did the coordinating, obviously very coordinated, um, as he did the needlework for those pillows. And the reason that I have them is my family has this uh, habit at family reunions, which we um, in normal times have every two to four years. And the family in large for large part of my family lives in Canada. Uh, and so we have them back and forth from one country to the other. But what we do is we have a family auction and what we and the auction raises money for the family coffers to help make the reunion better. But what we do, in addition to just ordinary things that go in the auction, then family collectibles and treasures go in. And we've had folks pay hundreds of dollars to get something like these pillows. And so I was fortunate enough, of course, a uh, Bill's, one of his daughters um, had the, the pillows and put them in the auction. So I don't remember how much I paid for them, but I didn't have to pay hundreds and hundreds of dollars. And so I'm glad to own them. And next slide, I'm going to try to move along quickly. I don't know we, we don't have an unlimited amount of time. And this is something from another cousin that is Portia again. And she, um, at a point, moved to New York, made her uh, debut uh, on the stage at Town Hall in 1944. We do not have the program from the 1944 debut at Town Hall, but this is from her a Town Hall recital the next year. Um, OK, next slide. So this is something. Um, we're talking about family treasures. So my husband said, well, do you, would you like something of mine? And I said, sure. And so he pulled out this pocket watch and um, his aunt, who is 90, about 95 years old, gave it to him. And when she gave it to him, she said that this, that she got it from her father, who would be my husband's grandfather. And that when he gave it to her, he said that it had belonged to his father. So basically, then that belong, would have belonged to my husband's great grandfather. And so we can't authenticate that chain of ownership. We can't, you know, really speak to the provenance. But what we did look is it's an Elgin watch. There is a, there are numbers, a code number, item number on the background on the back of the watch. And when we look it up, we find that it was made approximately 1888. So we won't know that if, if it really did belong to uh, Major Timothy McNeil. And that was his name, Major. That wasn't the title. Uh, was born in 1864. But it is of appropriate age that it might. And the interesting thing about this is its face, it's like a locket. So you, you've got the watch and you open it, but then the photograph you see on the right is actually a space that you could put a photograph. And so um, I don't know anything about watches, but I thought that was um, different from the ones I had seen at least. Okay, next slide. So this um, tells a story. I'm going to try to move this quickly, but you know, uh, around the 
early in the around the turn of the 20th century and then even early into the first 20 or 30 years of the 20th century many of the black high schools were in, in the state of virginia were not accredited so what that meant is students they you know there was a four three years uh they didn't have a real um high school diploma as such and so then they had to go somewhere else and so uh our institutions knew that and so on the campus of virginia state college for negroes which is what the present virginia state university was called at that particular time there was actually a high school and so you finish the 11th grade in your rural area of course there were accredited high schools in richmond and norfolk and places like that but you finished high school then you went to virginia state to finish high school again at virginia state high school and so this is uh my on and lost diploma from 1930. and the next slide is a uh, very similar um my father and his brother um, of course went to an unaccredited high school and then they went to boarding a nut well the unaccredited high school they went to was a boarding school in essex county the rapanic industrial academy that didn't become um, accredited till a couple of years after they graduated so then they went to boarding school again down in chase city virginia at fine institute and this is my father's diploma from then his second time finishing high school but fine institute um, accredited and because that's a whole nother story and when we talked about this we've shown the buildings of fine institute um, to kind of flavor that story and this is my great grand my grandfather at least and he was a high school well no he was a teacher it wasn't high school because uh, the schools in the rural area there were not so much high schools no public high schools um so it was a one-room school where he taught grades one through seven or eight and this was his school bell that he used i actually have that bell in fact it's right behind me in this room that he used to uh, call students um, when it was time to class to start or recess or what have you and Chris, when we shared um at our family gathering virtual gathering then a cousin of mine said this is granddaddy's bell of course we didn't none of us knew him obviously he died in 1935 and i said well i've got his bell and so i think the conclusion is that he probably had more than one bell <laughs> but at any rate that's the bell he used um next slide and these are so he in addition to being a, a, a teacher he was a preacher and so i've got a book of a little notebook of his sermons and so this is just a page so one of my um tasks that i need to do is to have these uh, have this book digitized and then of course to transcribe the sermons at a point and that's it's a thick book he, he wrote a lot of sermons so that's uh, on my list to do and uh, this is a cousin um, as I researched him, um, J. Harold Montague, we pronounce it Montague, but this man's father was my grandmother's brother, left King and Queen County um, on the steamboat. And when he got to Hartford, he left King and Queen County as Montague. We got to Hartford, he was Montague. But anyway, so the pronunciation is a little different. Um, but he was a conductor, composer, created the music department at Virginia State. and it, actually arranged a lot of music so this is his arrangement of let us break bread together and that's uh, j harold montague conducting the virginia state college choir and he created the department he was um at virginia state from 1933 until 1950 when he died so very suddenly um, next slide and so this is my father and this um who died, he was uh, 99 and three quarters uh, when he died just before his 100th birthday. But this chair, he actually made in grade school. And he was, um, as we talk about family histories, telling people stories, I've learned since he died now, almost 10 years ago, what an artist he was. And I never thought of him as an artist, but, and he was a multimedia artist, because you'll see that he created, I mean, he create anything. and. Um, of course, we know that, um, I'll never forget, I was um, making a costume for my daughter so all night, dressing her as Cleopatra, and I'd just wake him up 
every once in a while to say, tell me how to do this or tell me how to do that because he was so skilled. But anyway, next slide. These are items that he made. So he would find um, a piece of wood and think it looked like something. And he had vision. He'd see and he'd take that piece of wood and embellish it to make it even look more like what he um what he saw and of course one of the things is that you need to tell your family of what you know about your family about your treasures you need to tell the young people what you know when we started talking about family treasures in the fall my daughter said looking at the lamp to the right she said i've looked at that lamp all my life i had no clue that granddaddy made it and of course I had no clue that she had no clue. And so um, you need to tell those stories. Um, next slide. And this is something that he made again. He was ever the artist. Um, my daughter was in the sixth grade at St. Catherine School. She had a project and she had a photograph of this uh, folk art reindeer that needed to be recreated. And of course, he recreated that exact thing. And of course, we don't have the photograph of what he was working from, but his looked exactly like the one that he was uh, was trying to recreate for her project. And in fact, it's, this means so much to her. When she went to speak at my father, her grandfather's funeral, she actually went into the pulpit of the church to speak, carrying this reindeer as a prop. And it gave her strength or inspiration to talk about her grandfather with this reindeer that he made. And this, yeah, go next slide. And this is Randolph White, the artist again, the artist, the entrepreneur. Um, when he was in the Pacific during World War II, um, he, of course, had a gig going. He was making and selling things. And this, and this is talk about telling the stories. So I knew that he made this bracelet and it was great detail. What I did not know until just recently, because, of course, I didn't pay attention to military things. People were talking military. I wasn't interested, so I wasn't listening. My husband told me that this bracelet was made from the metal of a downed Japanese fighter plane. And that's what my father told him. I had no idea. So you need to listen. Next slide. Um, we, are we doing okay on time, Caitlin and Marilyn? Are we? Yeah, we're okay. And we have, yeah. um, it It's a, ends at 11, but it's not like a, won't shut us out. So okay. <laughs> we can go a little. We won't get cut off yeah. at 11. Okay. <laughs> So I am fortunate to have, this is my mother's um, college graduation picture, 1933 at Virginia State College for Negroes, which was its name at the time. And I actually have the commencement invitation. And why do I have that? So I found it in an envelope that is addressed to a relative. So I can only conclude that what probably happened is in later years, that relative's daughter gave my mother the invitation back because it's the this is the invitation that was mailed to somebody. And I don't have one that she kept. But anyway, that's the actual invitation. You can't read it there, but it is the invitation for the 48th commencement. Uh, next slide. And this is the commencement program. Um, and I'm just, and I can't even remember. And we talk about how you got stuff. So you really, I've learned now, you really need to note where something came from. I have no clue how this came into my possession. I do not know. Well, I found it in my mother's possessions, but I you know, don't even know what I thought as to did she save it or what. But anyway, or did she get it from the same person that she got the invitation from? I don't know, but this is the commencement program. So it allows me to tell a pretty complete story about her experience there. And of course, she had done that Virginia State High School piece as well. I don't have her high school diploma. I don't have the college diploma or the diploma for a master's or anything like that. But she did do that year of high school. And of course, the story as we try to tell all those stories is that during that extra year of high school, she was taking biology, chemistry, and physics because her high school had no labs. So it was a crazy year. Uh, next 
slide. And this is, is so special to me. This is my parents' wedding invitation, or oh, not wedding invitation, wedding announcement, because it was a small at-home wedding, so few people attended. And just about three years ago, I had a cousin to call me, and she said, I'm closing out the family home. She was living in the home um, that her parents had moved into when they married in 1918, and that home had been continuously lived in. And you talk about a treasure trove, homes that people have lived in for long periods of time. You don't know what is there. And so when, you know, I had a situation recently, I found out a home was being closed out after everything had been thrown away. And it wasn't a relative of mine, it was a person in the community, but I just um, saddens me to think about what was thrown away. But at any rate, as we, uh, I went to her home and was with her for six or seven hours and just going through papers. And so I found this envelope addressed to her parents, Mr. and Mrs. Thomas Jones, that says, um, at Elsom, Virginia, which is, you know, we, another, we talk about as we do family and community history, those old place names that have disappeared. So that's one of them. It's in King and Queen County. And it, you can't see the postmark, but it says Tappahannock, and it says April 13th, 1942. And that's my grandmother's handwriting. I happen to know it. And so this is the announcement of the wedding that took place in their dining room on the day before. And so I'm sure she had the announcements ready to be mailed because they are actually postmarked the next day after the wedding. And I've forgotten now the, the postage, I think maybe it was two cents or so, I can't really see it there. But um, so next, and so as we tell the story, we wanna, okay, that's the announcement of the wedding. So then on the next slide, we actually have the wedding pictures. And so um, this was in the dining room and you see that it's wartime. So um, you know, the bride is uh, dressed in a navy blue suit. Um, so it's no, um, no frilly stuff here, okay? And I'm so fortunate to have these pictures. Um, this is a ring that uh, it's really interesting because it's those are individual rings there about a dozen rings that make up individual rings that make up this ring and this was um belonged to my aunt who gave it to me as a gift on her 80th birthday and it was kind of interesting i went to visit her in the nursing home and i had you know, something modest for her but she had something for me and she took this ring off and gave it to me and so it's one of my prized possessions a little few pave diamonds there on the on the rectangle and i don't know its provenance don't know where she got it um and this is just as we talk about um things that are family treasures that you may not think about so my one of my uncles my one of my many uncles my father had um but six brothers who um grew to live to adulthood one of them um, worked at the Naval Weapons Station. That was his full-time gig, but his part-time gig was he was a barber. And so that's my uncle. It's not a really good picture, but that's my uncle to the left um, in his barber shop. And so as my cousin looked at Family Treasures, she had this picture. And then the next slide, we have his, his final license as a barber from the Commonwealth of Virginia. And then going to the next slide, my cousin had his tools. And so she's kept them. And um, you know, I don't know how long that hairspray and powder, I mean, he's been dead for 20 plus years. So that may be, um, the, I don't know whether those things have soured, but anyway, those are, um, those are the tools of his trade, but they help us to tell his story. And now this is something really unusual. Um, my uncle says, and his, he, he's the birthday boy this month. He just turned 90 years old. He's my only, the only, my father's only surviving sibling and he was 90 years old on February 11th. And he takes pits, peach pits 
and carves them, which is kind of different. And he says that he was taught to do it by his grandfather. And of course, his grandfather, you saw the one who made the chair, um, died when my uncle was five years old. So I think he learned early from his grandfather how to carve this peach pit. And he just, it's meticulous work. He carves it and it's a, it's a chain, um, actually a charm that he puts on a puts on a chain and so and so this particular peach pit charm was carved by my young cousin who is the grandson of the 90 year old uncle and so what we've got is this whole thing passed down and you know however many generations that is that my uncle got it from his grandfather he's passed it on his grandson and so and I don't own a peach pit charm I'm not sure why I've been asking for one for a few years. And so I'm hoping that when it's peaches come in that um, my uncle will make me a peach pit charm or somebody will make me one, but I love to have one made by my uncle. Um, next slide. Okay, so, um, and I realized that you had I had a different PowerPoint that uh, didn't get sent. So I'll tell you about that. But um, I have a handout for you and the National Museum of African American History and Culture at the Smith New Museum at the Smithsonian has spent um, quite a bit of effort in terms of trying to get folk to preserve those family treasures. So there are multiple um, handouts, multiple documents from them. Um, they are on the um, the source list and so caitlin you're able to put that into the chat hopefully um if separate um tab for handouts and so you'll find that as well as the oral history flyer for um lchs um okay. it seems like 100 thank you that would be great and on that you got <laughs> several um several things that can help you do this work but um uh, even preservation a preservation supply list and so that tells you about purchasing archival supplies, whether they're acid-free um, sleeves or what have you. Um, and so there are all kinds of instructions for how to preserve certain things. And you find that in uh, the sources from the Smithsonian. Just know that, and I won't get deeply into that. It's not my area of expertise, but just know that extremes in temperature, and sunlight and pests like insects are all enemies of your treasures. And so just know that you want to look at how, um, how textiles should be preserved, how your photographs should be preserved, how your documents should be preserved and so on. And uh, all of that content is in this material. Um, I had a slide and I'll just tell you about it. In fact, I don't know whether I can even show it to you old, old style, but um, there are several mysteries. I have a covered bowl that was said to have come from and belonged to the grandmother in Richmond. Now, this is a family from King and Queen County. And for some unknown reason, I never ask, well, who was the grandmother in Richmond? What was her name? Whose grandmother was she? And as I look at the family that this came from, the only thing I can perhaps generalize is that my great grandmother uh, died fairly young in childbirth as so many women did in the 1880s. And she was young, she was in her thirties. And so, I'm thinking that the grandmother in Richmond might have been her mother because this um, her husband was born in 1837. So it's not likely that we were talking about his mother. So the only thing I can say about this covered bowl, it is fine bone China, China it's Haviland, it's um, uh, Rosario is the pattern. And so I've looked it up and that pattern was, or that, China from uh, Haviland was made 
initially in the 1880s. So it is uh, potentially of an age that it could have belonged to the mother of someone who was in their 30s in 1880s. But I don't have uh, any further information and I unfortunately probably won't. So uh, just as in closing, and I want to yeah, have some time for a discussion, is I put this photograph in, and this is um, my father and his um, eight siblings and their spouses and their mother, who was my father's stepmother, and her then husband, because my grandfather had, had died many years before. And so not only is it wonderful because of course it's all them on the picture, but you see the handbag, that's my mother there just to the left of the photograph. And so it's a black patent leather handbag with a tortoise shell handle. And I own that, I have had it restored or you know, they worked on it to recondition the leather and that kind of thing, but I use it. I mean, I actually use that handbag. Of course, I don't use it now because I don't go anywhere because of the pandemic, but um, it is something. And I was thinking, so this handbag is at least 52 years old because that was 1970 when this picture was taken and it's now 2022. And I don't know how, when my mother bought the bag, but anyway, that is uh, something. And it's just really great that I can, I see it. Um, she has is using it on this um, on this occasion. So, uh, in conclusion, I'll just read it. We hope that you start to see those heirlooms through a new lens. Uh, so you want to remember and document all of the objects and the tales that accompany them, because you have heard from some of the things that I've found out that I've not passed the stories on that I should have passed on, and I didn't get the stories from the elders while they could tell me. And so if I could roll back the clock, I would uh, be sure to ask more questions and to document. And I think it takes being intentional about preserving the family treasures, identify them, preserving them, and to make sure that uh, then they are there for posterity. So you want to get started. I mean, right now, identify and locate your family treasures. Write down everything that you know about them. And one of those um, guidelines from the Smithsonian gives you a form to do that. Um, write that down. Share what you know with other family members, especially the young ones, and then care for your treasures appropriately. So I'm going to stop there. Next slide, I think it's probably just if you have questions. And I'd love to hear um, your questions and hear your experiences with family treasures. Posada, there was a question in the chat. Um, was George in Virginia his whole life? You mentioned- I, what, Speak a little louder, Marilyn. Was George in Virginia? his whole life. Okay, so the, let's see, I remember the only George that we've talked about is George Granville White Sr., um, who was born in 1857 and died in 1937. And yes, he lived in King and Queen County his whole life. Um, we don't know whether he ever traveled away from King and Queen because a very interesting photograph that I have right on my mantle behind me that of is of his well there are six brothers on that picture and the five brothers were at a studio in baltimore when the picture was taken that we figure the picture must have been around the time that william andrew was graduating from wayland so it's before he left for nova scotia so the picture is probably taken around the late 1890s and 1900 and George Granville White is not on the picture. He has been superimposed onto the picture. So you see him, he's there with the other brothers, but his head is a little bit large. You know, the proportion is not quite. And you say, wait a minute, why does he look so strange? Because he's been applied to this photograph. And so he wasn't in Baltimore with his brothers, but we do know though that he, as even as I say that, he lived there in King and Queen all his life, but he, we have, 
wonderful oral history about his traveling to Washington, D.C. So he did visit out of county. Okay. Hey. Well, we have great compliments for your presentation. And um, that question was from Teresa, but Jerome Selden says that um, she visited the Black Museum in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And when she heard and saw pictures of a minister, Reverend Andrew White and Portia White, um, she could not wait to see you to tell to ask about them. So it's a small world. It's amazing how you wouldn't think someone here would have seen your relative over in Nova Scotia. Yeah, well, I'll tell you about that. Thanks, Jerome, for sharing that. Um, the way that uh, William Andrew White, okay, so we don't know. I mean, you get from King and Queen County to Washington, D.C to go to Wayland Seminary. And of course, apparently, I mean, we don't know, um, did he only do the seventh, seventh grade at the one room school, or did he possibly go to one of those Negro academies like the Gloucester, um, the Gloucester Industrial Academy that would have been a high school that was uh, founded in 1888. So we don't know what, you know, between King and Queen Courthouse and the, um, one room school in Wayland. We don't really know what he did, but he got to Wayland. He graduated from Wayland. And at Wayland, um, there was, he was taught by a white woman uh, named Isabel Blackador. And um, he, she told him that she felt, she was from Nova Scotia, The things were so much better for Negroes in Nova Scotia than in the United States. And so he wanted, of course, Waylon was a uh, normal school, you know, kind of like an associate degree today. And he wanted to get a baccalaureate degree, and but he didn't have any money. He was really bright, but he didn't have any money. So she, uh, Miss Blackador told him that um, if he would go to Nova Scotia, that she would assist him in uh, trying to get into it, be admitted to her alma mater, which was Acadia University. And she'd also help to try to find some scholarship money. And so he took Miss Blackador up on her offer and she delivered on her part of it. And so he was admitted to uh, Acadia and he, there was money found. He was an outstanding athlete at Acadia. He graduated, um, he married a mixed race Canadian woman um, who identified as black, but she was um, native as well. In fact, her family had uh, come from the United States enslaved during the war of 1812 and when they were liberated by the British. Uh, but at any rate, and had 13 children in Canada. So that is why um, there's so much, and they, you're right, they all over the Black History Center in Nova Scotia. We didn't talk about the one of the photographs I showed was of the stamp, the Portia White stamp. And so the Canadian government um, did a stamp for Portia probably 25 years ago now. And um, so the yeah, tremendous impact upon upon Canada. Um, we have an, another um, question from Robin. Um, she has a Blackstone connection from Southern Maryland in the early 20th century. Can you share your photo and information from, can you share your photo and information from the graduation fo photo? And was it the Wayland graduation? Okay, I did not hear the early part of, of that question. <laughs> I, I heard, was it the Wayland graduation? Yeah. But so she has a Blackstone connection from Southern Maryland in the early 20th century. Can you share your photo and information from the graduation photo? And was that Way the Wayland graduation? Yes, I think I'm hearing that. That was the Wayland 1897 graduation photo. Um, we got it from the archives, a special collection at Virginia Union. We recognized, in fact, if you want to go back to yep. that, slide. Uh, Caitlin, maybe you can bring it up. Um, we recognize William Andrew White in the center of the photograph. He's very distinctive um, in the center. <laughs> we're getting there. <laughs> yeah, we're getting there. We are getting there. 
shortly. We'll be there. Okay, yes, that is the Whalen class of 1897. Um, and that was provided to me by Celicia Gregory Allen. And I think, I guess Celicia is still at Virginia Union. I've spoken to her since the beginning of the pandemic, but she was the archivist there. And um, that is the class of 1897, according to Virginia Union. And of course, Virginia Union, they had the photograph they didn't have the invitation, so I shared with them the invitation. Um, and so, yes, that is the photograph, and there he is in the center. And I, I didn't hear, what was the part about Southern Maryland? Um, she has a connection um, to Blackstone in um, Southern Maryland from the early 20th century. To Black? It says Blackstone connection. I don't know if that's a typo. <laughs> Instead of black kiss stone. Okay, I should look into the chat. But yes, that is um that is the class of 1897. And then the the next photograph, um, just go to that is the photograph of William Andrew White from the Bloxon uh, collection, the William Steele papers at, at Temple. And that actually is writing on that that says, um, very truly yours at the, at the top, Reverend Dr. Andrew W. Andrew White, BA at Acadia University 03. And so um, this was apparently sent to the Steele family um, at some point after 1903. Of course, the connection is I've said that um, the researcher who found this picture online in the uh, Temple Archive um, is in the Waller family and William Still's granddaughter married in the Waller family. But um, it's, 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 we all interconnected. Uh, my great great grandmother, who would have been the mother of the William Andrew White, pictured here when her husband, and so th this was William Andrew White the second that you're looking at. Bill, who did the needlepoint, was the third, one of his sons. But this man's father, William Andrew White the first, uh, my double great grandfather, died when he was, you know, about 50. And so his wife, Isabella Waller White remarried, and she married a man named William Robert Waller, and it's that person's daughter who married Stills' grandson. So it's like Waller White Stills, as they're all interconnected. So it wasn't too surprising, since we do know that connection, to find this photograph in the Still papers. Um, so clarification. Um... Robin says that on um, it is Blackiston, but it's this um, on here on the graduation invite. There's an A H Blackiston listed, um, so I think that that's what she was referencing. Okay, sure. Yeah. Well, I'm happy to. Um, I mean, this is in the slide. I'm happy to share um, to share this invitation, and so. Um, to send a copy of it. Very happy to, to do so. It's interesting that um, back a long time ago on Afrogenius, and those of you who've been doing uh, genealogy a while, remember when the Afrogenius website was very, very active. Someone that I connected with on Afrogenius probably, oh, 15 or more years ago, a long time ago, actually someone in Maryland had the Wayland graduation invitation. And it was before most of us were not scanning and emailing and that kind of thing. And so that person, I don't know who he was, went to the, I don't remember, went to his post office and made a photocopy of that for me, a, a kind of bad photocopy, but I was appreciative that he, he did what he could. And so I had this photocopy. And then in recent years, I've run into someone in this vast network of African-American genealogists who had a transcription of it, um, that still chasing that invitation. And then now probably 
three years ago is when Davlin Talaferro, who's a, such a, a genealogist and researcher, um, actually came to one of our genealogy meetings and said, I have something for you. And she gave me the original invitation and she had it because someone um, from Middlesex County, from the Deltaville area of Middlesex was in that Wayland class as well. And so she happened to, uh, the original invitation came into her possession. in D.C. Why would the commencement for Wayland what? Held in D.C. Washington. Because Wayland was in D.C. Yeah. Wayland Seminary was in D.C. So when you look up, I guess, you know, go to the Virginia Union University website and look at um, the origins of Virginia Union. And I'm not going to pretend to be able to state that Virginia Union history. But basically, if I can remember, it's the three institutions that came yeah. together, Wayland Seminary, Hotshawn Memorial College, yeah. and then whatever the Richmond institution mm -hmm. is that came out of Lumpkins Jail and all yeah. that. And I'm, I'm not even going to try to say that because I'll get it wrong. But um, Wayland was in Washington, D.C. Yeah, and they all formed later, and right. I think it was formed Virginia Union University. Yep, yep, but I think Wayland was its own entity starting in like the eighteen ninety, like mm -hmm. early eighteen nineties. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's my understanding as well. Yeah, um, and, and Virginia the Union does have a lot of that. I mean, they have because you know that's one of the institutions that came together to make Virginia Union. So they do have a lot of that Production. material and are always looking for additional material. And um, that's a really good point too, is that, you know, I've found this in my own family history. Um, a lot of things that used to exist have been, you know, taken over by larger institutions or documents have gone from one institution to a larger state institution. So while a certain place or um, group might not exist anymore, some of those records may have been transferred to another institution at, at a later period in time. So that's a good point to bring up is that, you know, when you're doing this, it you might not, <laughs> you might be looking well, for something and not in the right location, so. Right, right. You have to look at the whole history to yeah. see where, um, just where, and I, I don't know, um, you know, I've always heard of Wayland Seminary, um, but I don't know. Um, it'd be interesting to look at those, the folks who were in that class and see, um, you know, where all they were from. But I believe though somewhere, and may not be on here, but somewhere is something that says where those people were from. Is there a, so I've got a transcription of that side yeah, maybe it's not okay. Something I have in my possession <laughs> um, says where those folk are from. Because the interesting thing about it is, William Andrew White is said to be from Baltimore, mm. and we know he's not from Baltimore. He's from King and Queen Courthouse, Virginia. But it may be that he came immediately from Baltimore yeah. because he had two brothers, older brothers, who had migrated to Baltimore. Um, one was there when his daughter was born in 1890. And so these folk had, so he may well, you know, have been in Baltimore. In fact, for all we know, he could have gone to high school in Baltimore because we don't know. Um, and that was something people did. You know, mm -hmm. of course, there was no high school in rural Virginia. Um, for someone, you know, born in the 1870s. Um, and, well, there was the, the school, in, the one school in Gloucester that started in 1888. So he could have even, I mean, even in the later generation in my family, because King and Queen County had no public high school for Black folk until way up in the 20th century. So in the 1930 census, we have a 22-year-old, uh, my first cousin once removed, who is the head of the household in Baltimore, and she's got her high school age siblings uh, in the home with her going to high school in Baltimore. So he, I mean, it would not be um, 
Now, outside of expectation that he could have lived in Baltimore um, with his siblings and gone to high school. So that may be why it says Baltimore. The sign. But I have to pull that. I do have that, um, whatever is the other document that says where all these folk were from. The Sada. Mm -hmm. um, that's another comment. The carved peach pits, are they basket intended to hold one good one's good luck? Are they baskets intended to hold one's good luck? Uh, you know, I have, have apparently not followed my own instructions for learning about treasures and asking them. I will have to call my uncle and ask him, you know, why do you carve peach pits? Why, why is, what does this basket, it looks like a basket, what does it mean? I don't know, but you have inspired me to find that answer. So I will call him today <laughs> and try to find the answer to that question. I have no idea um, what the meaning deep or otherwise is of why he carves peach pits and it, it certainly looks like a basket. Yeah. Do you see any other questions, Caitlin, in the chat? I, I do not. Um, okay. I think we've covered them all. Yeah, well, I think we've come to a closure point. Unless there's some final words you'd like to say, Vasada? You know? Well, the only thing I would say is do enjoy this um, process of, of finding your family treasures. And as I said, I've always collected things. I mean, they've been around me, but I guess it was, um, it was actually last October um, when I kind of started on this really being intentional, very intentional about the treasures. And I've found all kinds of things that I um, would not have thought about. And then you think about what are the treasures that you are creating? Because things that you're doing now, I mean, you're making the history of tomorrow. And so be intentional as well about saving the program from something you did, about associating the photograph of something that you're doing with the item. And so be very, very intentional about it would just uh, be my um, suggestion. And it is really, really so much fun. I mean, we have had a good time. We, we did, we shared treasures at our uh, December genealogy meeting. Uh, my family was actually so into what we're doing um, that what they said is, whoa, this was the best Christmas dinner ever. And, you know, we didn't even have food because, I mean, we had your food at home, but, you know, they thoroughly enjoyed it. And what they said was, we'd like to continue because now that they saw what some of the treasures were, then they were inspired. They said, well, I do have my mm -hmm. grandfather's, um, you know, one of them, um, not related to me, but my, my aunt-in-law's father, was a fisherman down in Westmoreland County. And so they've got some of his tools of the fishing trade. And so just um, all kinds of stuff. So it's inspiring. And I um, encourage you to all uh, collect what are your treasures and to create those new treasures that will be the treasures of tomorrow. Okay. Uh, well, we've provided an email for the cider in the chat it is cawthonwhite at gmail.com if you care to correspond or follow up with some other questions and um i just want you to realize on the screen you have our contact information if you screenshot it you have everything but main thing to remember to reach us louisahistory.org <laughs> and just search around in our website. It'll lead to other sites. We represent the African-American History Program component of Louisa 
County Historical Society. And we just want you to know that we're grant funded and we've been uh, funded by the Charlottesville Area Community Grant Foundation, as well as the Virginia, I mean, his Humanities, Virginia Humanities and the Rappahannock Electrical, Electric Cooperation. So we thank them for their contributions. Um, do know that we will continue to uh, welcome any donations or any services or opportunity to volunteer with any other programs. These are the kinds of things we would like to obtain from you, the help. You know, if you have artifacts that you may want to have us photograph or loan to the museum for an exhibit to add to our collection, we welcome that. As we said, thematically, we, we share with you the opportunity to express your voice. We're listening to voices. And in order to change the equation and build up a better collection for research in the museum and the uh, historical society, you have to follow suit. You have to offer, you have to just Get, get busy with us. This is your community, and we thank you for allowing us to share this uh, presentation with you today. Mm -hmm. And keep following us. We have one more presentation in this month of February, and that will be February 26th yep. with Janice Ross Lawrence, and her topic will deal with her family coming from this Louisa County. <laughs> Her family from the Louisa County community. So tune in next week. Yeah, and just, I wanna say uh, thank you to Besida for helping out and uh, lending us your expertise. This is kind of a collaborative process for most of our uh, residents. And, you know, if we can be of any help at the Historical Society, whether it's genealogical research, whether it's simply more information on how to preserve your documents, um, please reach out. We'd love to be involved and uh, get to know you all better. So thank you. And I hope you have a wonderful Saturday. Bye, all. All right. Bye.